Hi there, welcome to my how to answer an Edexcel 30 mark A-level politics essay question. Um, what I'm going to do today is uh, I'm going to go through as quick as possible and, and in the most simplest form, I'm going to go through how to answer a 30 mark question. Uh, if you've got any questions, you can link them in the comments below and uh, I normally answer questions within a day. Uh, do remember to subscribe to my channel. It's a new channel, so thank you for the 62 subscribers that have already signed up. And uh, I hope to do many more videos, including content videos as uh, the years progress. Um, you can also go over to my website, alevelpolitics.com. Um, I've traditionally put most of my videos straight up to my uh, onto my website. I think a few students mentioned that I should be on YouTube. So I've decided to to take the plunge and to to start um, a YouTube channel. So you're welcome to go to my website for more videos and tutorials as well as exemplar essays. And you can head over to alevelpolitics.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Patel Shop. And uh, uh, oh, yes, it's uh, you can also uh, follow this link, alevelpolitics.substat.com. It's all the link is also on my website. Where and you can sign up to my email newsletter. So I send out a weekly newsletter, uh, and what I try to do is I try to link political stories to the A-level politics syllabus. So even if you don't study at Excel, by the way, and you, you're an AQA student, I think that Substack would be quite quite good for you to sign up to. So do head over to that and uh, and make sure you don't miss an email that I may send out. Okay. So as I said. Um, I've got, you know, a website and uh, in particular on my website, I've got uh, a revision hub where I try to put uh, all sort of uh, all details, information, uh, videos uh, uh, that you may require to uh, to make sure that uh, your revision is up to scratch. Uh, so you can head over to that as well as this essay section, uh, which really has uh, essays, but also documentaries that you may want to watch uh, pertinent to to politics. So um, uh, let's continue. Um, so let's go through firstly the basics of essay writing, the basics of a 30 mark uh, question. Right. So the first thing to say is that uh, you have to answer 30 markers in all of your exams. So you've got a, you've got 30 markers to answer. In fact, you answer two 30 markers in paper one, two in paper two, and two in paper three. Now, with paper one and two, uh, you get to answer a source question and a non-source question. What I'm going to teach you today will actually apply to source questions as well. However, I've got a separate video which tackles how you interrogate sources. So look at that separate video to, to get very a very specific answer to how to approach a source 30 mark question. However, uh, the skills today will, will help you answer, structure a 30 mark source question as well. So uh, this applies to all three of your exams. Now, students often ask me, uh, is there a difference between the 30 marker for, for say one and two and the 30 marker for component three? And I would answer in basics, no. There may be some additional things you've got to do uh, in in your in your component free essays, but essentially uh, the core skills are the same. So I think what I'm going to say today applies for all free papers, as I've said. Um, the component two essay also has, uh, so you also have to make a link to component one in the non-source component two essay, right? Um, so synopticity is simply a link. And in your non-source essay question, not your source question, in your non-source essay question, you have to make a link to component one uh, in some shape or form. Now, examiners always say that you do that anyway. Most students will do that without fail anyway. It's just a normal thing to do. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about that, uh, except to say that, um, you know, you've just got to have a conscious uh, effort. You've got to make a conscious effort to make those links. And and uh, I've got a video where I explain synoptic links. So you may want to have a look at that. Uh, but it's a short video just explaining where synopticity lies in the course. OK, um, 
Now, a Ferdi Mark essay has to be constructed in a form of a debate. Uh, so you have to show both sides of the debate and give a fair balance, right? So you, you can't just be one-sided. You've got to show the debate, but you've got to come down on one side. So you've got to favour one side of the debate. So an essay can be described as an argument with balance. You're making an argument. You're forming a view. You've come to a view, but you're showing the other side of the story. You're showing, you're giving the other side due balance. It's not, however, a balanced piece with an argument on top. Typically, what some students do is they place uh, the judgment, the opinion at the very end of the essay. And it's impossible to know where the student lies because they're over emphasizing the balance. You can't do that. You have to uh, start with a judgment and you have to argue a line of argument, a, a judgment throughout your essay. And you've got to then come back at the very end with a judgment, right? So it's important to, to bear that in mind. Uh, so the examiner is looking for an argument from the start. What is your answer to the question? And this must be a thread that stitches your essay together. And I'm going to talk about interim and embedded judgments as a means to stitch your essay together and show your judgment as we go along. OK. Now, I'm going to say a few words about assessment objectives. Now, this isn't so important in a way, um, but uh, uh, to start with, you've got to know, of course, when you write an essay, you've got to know what you're targeting. Um, so as you go along, it's going to become second nature. But I think it's worth saying it. And I, I always say to students when I start the course that it's, it's important to know about assessment objectives. So let's... Um, uh, let's talk about the three assessment objectives that you've got to target in essays, AO1, AO2 and AO3. AO1 is knowledge and that includes factual explanations and examples, right? So when you give facts, when you give examples, you're basically targeting AO1, you're targeting knowledge. AO2 is analysis and I'm, go I'm going to dedicate an entire slide or two to analysis, so I'll come back to analysis later. But analysis is extremely important in a paragraph. And AO3 is evaluation. That's your judgment, right? Now, you may put judgments within a paragraph, but also your judgments, as I've said already, have to be in your introduction and your conclusion. Um, so I'm going to talk about evaluation as well as we go along. But each of these AOs are worth 10 marks. So you get 10 marks for analysis, you get 10 marks for knowledge, you get 10 marks for evaluation. And you've got to make sure that you give enough time to all three. Uh, I find that sometimes students, they get the knack of this quickly. They, they place, they put into an essay knowledge skills, knowledge uh, stats and, and, ex and, and explanations pretty pretty well and they're, they're quite sound at doing that. But they miss out analysis sometimes or their analysis is not developed or they miss out evaluation. So the evaluation, the judgment marks are lost, which are 10 marks, right? Um, so you've got to make sure you've got, you've got not an equal, uh, but you've got uh, a, uh, you've got, you make reference to uh, all three of these skills or of these objectives. Let's call them objectives. All three of these objectives as you write your essays. So let's make a start with introductions and how you introduce your essay. Now, introductions are very important. Um, so it, it's worth uh, making sure you dedicate, you know, a good few minutes to an introduction. In an essay, in an exam setting, you may spend up to five minutes on an introduction. Uh, I think as you write essays, you may get that down to three or four minutes. Uh, but don't just introduce by giving a couple of lines. That's not a good idea because uh, introductions set for examiners, uh, what your essay is going to be about. And so you've got to make sure that you impress the examiner from the very start. Now, don't just repeat yourself in an introduction. Don't just say things over and over again. And certainly don't uh, tell a story in your introduction. Don't end up uh, repeating or or explaining um, some, some very long narrative. That's not required, right? So the students then say to me, sir, what, what can I put into an introduction? And I would say there are four things you can put into an introduction. Firstly, 
If there are key terms in the question, define those key terms. Presidentialism, codified constitutions. These are really important um, uh, ideas uh, to define and find a quick pithy definition of these, uh, so of, of the key terms that you may get in questions so that you can define questions. Secondly, you've got to set out the political context, right? Why are they asking the question? And I'm going to give you some examples of political context as we go along. But I've mentioned political context here. So, for example, if you get a question on presidentialism, you may want to talk about why Tony Blair is really the key example that illustrates how a president, how a prime minister has become more presidential. Right. So give the context. Uh, if you get a, con a, a question about cabinet government, again, you may raise Tony Blair, but you may also talk about uh, the uh, talk about Boris Johnson and the fact that he's been accused of undermining cabinet government by uh, by appointing people like Dominic Cummins. Uh, if you get a question on, I don't know, the strength, the, the relationship between the executive and parliament, again, you may make reference to the most recent parliaments and how the executive's power has declined in parliaments, especially under Theresa May and minority governments. So a quick reference to the political material out there. And as I said, my Substack um, uh, news bulletin is really helpful for this because you want to show the examiner that this is a politics essay. It's not a theoretical essay. I get sometimes I, I get questions from teachers and uh, and they ask me how current should a student be? And I would say the more current you are, the better your essay is going to be um, like, you know, it's often the case that uh, sometimes students, they study politics as if it's a history discipline. And so they and of course, you need to know about past examples. But essentially, the majority of your examples have got to be contemporary. And you want to show that in your introduction. You certainly need a judgment from the very beginning. Now, I've said this as, uh, previously, but a judgment is extremely important. And I'm going to illustrate what a judgment is and what isn't a judgment. Right. So you've got to tell the examiner what your opinion is. Right. Here's a good example of an essay introduction that was written by who wrote this I think it was Rebecca uh, an example from one of my students that I tutored last year and uh, she put uh, the following into an introduction now this introduction is available the full essay is available on my website it's an essay about Thatcherism and if I remember right I should have put the question here but if I remember right it was uh, whether the current Conservative Party remains a Thatcherite party so let's go through this introduction. Firstly, Thatcherism. So she, she dedicates the first part of her introduction with some definitions. Thatcherism is an ideology that consists of both neoliberal and neoconservative ideas named after Margaret Thatcher. OK, fair enough. It is a belief in a free market developed on the principles of Adam Smith and a strong enforcement of law and order, a patriotic focus on foreign policy and traditional conservative family values. You know, some could say this is uh, you're overegging it here. There's, there's a little too much there, but I think it's OK. I think it's a nice pithy definition of what Thatcherism is. Give me a second while I sip my water. Hmm. So uh, she goes on to say the current conservative government under Boris Johnson has been accused of economically moving away from Thatcherism to an economy that has more state intervention. That's political context, right? The current Conservative government, it's of Boris Johnson. I'm given the political context. The argument today by a lot of Conservatives and non-Conservatives alike is that this Conservative Party does not look like a Thatcherite party because it's moved away economically from, uh, from the policies of Margaret Thatcher. OK, so, you know, political context. However, but it will be argued that together with the economy, social issues and law and order, Thatcher still remains the aspiration of mainstream conservatives. Hence, the party remains a Thatcherite party. Right. I'm doing two things there. In, in the blue, what I'm doing here or what she's doing or what the student is doing is they're setting out their three sections. They're setting out their arguments. Right. Now, I'm going to talk about this a bit later on, but uh, you've got to have essentially three areas 
if you can. Uh, sometimes you can get away with two, but you essentially got to have three areas that you're going to be engaging with in the essay. I call them free sections. What this student here is doing is, is just highlighting the free sections. So she's going to go on to talk about the economy, social issues and law and order. All right, so that's setting out your arguments. Um, and lastly, we've got a judgment. Thatcher still remains the aspiration of mainstream conservatives, hence the party remains a Thatcherite party. Now, this is a really clear judgment. It's answering the question. Tip for you all, don't say to an extent. Don't say, hence the party remains a Thatcherite party to an extent, right? I don't say, you know, I like ice cream to an extent. You know, I, I don't really say that. I either like it or I don't like it. I don't sort of, you know, or forget ice cream. Ice cream is not a good example. I don't say I like, you know, Alfonso mango to an extent. Now, if any of you know anything about mangoes, you will know that Alfonso is the gold standard of mangoes. It's the Muhammad Salah of mangoes. It's the highest peak you can get, right, of mangoes. You know, fine, honey mangoes are okay. Case of mangoes, okay. You know, they're not so bad. But you can't beat you know, the Alfonso mango from India. It, it is a special breed of mangoes. Um, uh, if you ever go past an Asian area in London, for example, and um, I mean, if you go past Green Street or... Walthamstow, Walthamstow Baker's Arms, right? Uh, you will come across lots of these stores that sell mangoes. And if you're lucky, you'll get an Alfonso mango box. And, um, you know, it's it's well worth it. So I don't say to an extent the Alfonso mango is, is great. I don't say that. I say for sure it's great, right? It's the best mango in the world. I'm very clear about it. You've got to be very clear in your introduction. Don't sit on the fence. Don't give me all these to what ex to, to an extent and, you know, it, it is and it isn't. You've got to be extremely clear in your introductions. I hope I've made uh, I've made my point clearer about mangoes, at least. Right. Let's then talk about structure. Now, examiners will always say the chief examiner. I wrote a letter to the chief examiner and asked them, do you have any uh, any uh, uh, do, like do you believe in a particular structure over another? Like, do you have any preferences? And he was, his response was, of course we don't. You know, we don't care about structure. We just care about how a student puts their arguments forward. And that is quite true. However, I'm not one of those teachers that say, well, just write what you want and don't worry about structure. Now, you don't have to have a formula, but you do have to have some form of structure. My advice to you is keep it simple. Have a structure that you stick to, stick with for one, two and three, for component one, two and three. So you don't have to think in your exam about how am I going to put this essay together? You sort of already have a template that you're going to apply to your essays. Now, my just my view and, and, and teachers may differ on this and, and they're perfectly reasonable to differ with this, by the way, because teachers are going to formulate different structures. So it, it's a perfectly reasonable position to have different structures as long as you have a structure. But my view is that you probably need an essay that's a three point essay. So you have an introduction, which I've just gone through. You have point one uh, with an embedded judgment. I'm going to explain that in a second. And then you have a counterpoint, which also has probably an embedded judgment. I'm going to explain that. And then finally, you have an interim judgment. Right. So point one, it, section one is really uh, a point counterpoint and an interim judgment, right? Point, counter, interim judgment. Section two, point two, is an embedded judgment, is a point with an embedded judgment, uh, a counter argument, and then an interim judgment. So these will go into, these three aspects will go into, put into your, uh, your second section, your point two. And then the third point is, uh, is, you know, your third point, your counterpoint, and then an interim judgment. So, in a sense, the, you're doing the same thing over and over three times, right? Um, and and that's how you put a, how I think you should put a 30 marker together. Now, in essence, an ideal essay consists of three sections. 
So you're engaging with three points. So in the case of Rebecca's introduction, I think she was going to look at the economy, social issues and law and order. So her point one would be on the economy, a point two would be on social issues and a point three would be on law and order and she would be arguing for and she would be arguing against, right? Uh, now, I prefer to separate the paragraphs. I prefer to have uh, a point one and uh, four and an against, a counterpoint uh, as a separate paragraph. You don't need to do that. I know some teachers obsess about having one big paragraph. I just find it a little bit funny when you've got like a page and a half and an exam sheet. Remember, these are really, these are, these are um, uh, exam papers are, are written, you know, the, the paper in the exam, the script in the exam. I'm trying to find the right word. The script in the exam are, are far, uh, are, is far less, um, I can't find my words now. You know, you, you th those scripts, uh, they're wider ruled. That's what I'm looking for. And so you may end up, if you have one whole paragraph, you may end up having like a paragraph that extends into two sides. And for me, you know, I've, I've been brought up in a traditional way. That doesn't look like a paragraph to me. That just looks like a, a chunk of text. Uh, anyway, I'm obsessing now about this. But my view is probably separate the two and psychologically it helps as well because you know then you've given enough time to a counter argument but it's up to you if your teacher insists of having one big paragraph for for and against just go with that because it's just a, it's just a, it's just a you know a, a space between right it's not a big deal um, so I put six paragraphs in the main body of the essay one two three four five six with an introduction and a conclusion. So an eight, eight paragraph essay. Now, some of you are going to ask me, well, what if I can't write that much? What if I can't put six paragraphs together for and against, for and against? There are, there's a trick around that or a, 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 a tip I can give you. And that is that either go with five paragraphs and in your final point, you raise a point in line with your judgment. So you've got three for your judgment, three paragraphs for your judgment and two paragraphs against. And I think that's a good idea. Um, or just give too many sent paragraphs, right? Or combine your for and against within that fifth paragraph. Uh, I, I think that's perfectly fine, um, uh, especially if you're running out of time. But I would engage with a third point. I don't think it's a good idea just to have two main points. I think a third point is probably quite important. So how you do that depends on how quick you can write. And of course, if you follow my uh, my video on how to revise, my I, my feeling is that students don't write enough essays. The more essays you write, the quicker you're going to get at um, articulating your arguments. And so inevitably, I always get students at the start of the year who say to me, so I can only really tackle two points. So that's all I'm going to do. And that's a really defeatist approach. And I say to them, no, write three paragraphs and, and aim for three paragraphs. And by the end of the year, they can put three separate sections, not paragraphs, sections, three sections together because they've just trained themselves to write quicker because they've written plenty of essays. So my view is that um, uh, practice makes perfect, as they say. Um, now, you don't always have to make it symmetrical. So this is quite symmetrical and balanced. As I said, you may end up having three points for and two points against, right? Uh, uh, and I've said this already, an essay is an argument with balance, not a balance piece with some argument. Okay, I'm going to say uh, I came across a student recently when I was doing one of my revision uh, sessions who said that his teacher told him uh, to write an essay with all the four points and then all the against points, so like fours and against. I think that's a bad idea uh, because the examiners, if you read the exam uh, reports, the examiner's reports, you find that they like the intertwined arguments. You directly tackle the point you're making, right? You don't move on to the next point. You tackle the point you're making. So I wouldn't leave a point hanging without a rebuttal, without a response. I think that's extremely important. So don't do what some students uh, told me they did. And they have, you know, most students don't do this, but they have like all their points and then they have uh, the second set of points uh, at the very end. I don't think that's a good idea. Let's say a few words about judgments, right? Because as I said, AO3 marks are worth 10 marks. And we've already said you get some AO3 in your introduction because in your introduction, you are laying out your judgments. 
Okay, Thatcher, you know, the Conservative Party has not moved away from Thatcherism, uh, isn't it? Or, you know, the government, uh, the um, uh, cabinet is not important uh, in today's uh, in today's executive. These are judgments, right, that you're making in an essay. First past the post should replace uh, should be replaced by uh, a proportional system. That's a clear judgment. So you write that in your introduction. But, and, and also in your conclusion, you're going to mirror that initial judgment. Um, don't ever write an essay where your conclusion judgment is different to your introductory judgment. I think that's a bad idea. Uh, you've got to have, you know, your judgment at the beginning is your judgment at the end. Now, some people get really worked up about this because they say, well, I've become convinced halfway through writing my essay with another argument, right? I wouldn't, you know, I think if by the time you're writing an essay in an exam, you probably should have formed views already. And and if you haven't, I think you're going to have to keep up the pretense. <laughs> you know, you're going to have to follow through on your initial uh, introductory judgment uh, because it's bad. It's a bad idea. It's an incoherent essay if you start with one judgment and then you end with the opposite judgment. Uh, however, here's the bigger point I'm going to make. In order to get the range of marks for AO3, your judgment must be embedded into the body of your essay. So, you know, I said you've got six paragraphs. You've got to have a smattering of judgments, evaluative points, AO3 points throughout that essay. Right. So the examiners must be constantly reminded of your final judgment, your final assessment. Uh, it's not good enough for an examiner to be told about your judgment in the introduction and then your essays are so perfectly balanced that you just don't know what the judgment is. If you were to cover up the introduction and the conclusion, would an, an examiner, would a marker be able to tell what your judgment is? And they should in reading when they read your essay. So there are two kinds of judgments that you can put into an essay. An embedded judgment, which typically is at the beginning of a paragraph and a beginning of a counter, and an interim judgment, which is normally at the end of your pair of paragraphs. Remember I said there are six paragraphs, four and against, four and against, four and against. So an interim judgment would happen on three separate occasions after each pair of paragraphs, right? I should have said at the, at the start, if you're not taking notes, you should be taking notes because I, I am saying this quite quickly. So it's worth noting this down. You know, normally when you write something down, uh, you're, uh, you're going to remember it because you've, you've, in a way, you've sort of, you've now transferred, you've processed that information into, into written form. So you've got these embedded judgments and you've got these interim judgments. Uh, and let me illustrate how an embedded judgment works. So an embedded judgment will be put into the starters of a paragraph, right? So here's an example of an embedded judgment. It may be argued, but incorrectly, that the Conservative Party has moved away from Thatcherism economically. This is because. So you've already said what I'm going to say in this paragraph is not... Uh, my view. It's incorrect. It's not a strong view. You may say it may be argued, but in a weak way. It may be argued inappropriately. I don't know if inappropriately is the right, right word. But anyway, you know, you're going to have to find, go to the thesaurus and find different ways of saying incorrectly. Uh, but you want to show the uh, examiner, you want to show the marker that you do not believe in this argument, but you're making the argument nevertheless, right? Because you want to show the balance. However, a stronger argument is that the current Conservative Party only moved away from Thatcherism to an extent, uh, uh, to the extent it has, be it has because of the COVID pandemic, right? So the reason why it's done it is because of the COVID pandemic, not because it really believes uh, that um, a, a uh, interventions in an economy is a good idea as a principle. So again, the stronger argument in your essay, you always want to make it clear when you start your paragraph whether you believe in what you're going to say or whether you're going to say it because you want to show balance, but you don't believe in it, right? So incorrectly, a stronger, a weaker argument, in a more appropriate argument. Uh, these are ways by which you, sh you embed your judgments. Again, if you're confused about this, uh, do head over to my website 
uh, alevelpolitics.com and you can see some example essays, especially the recent ones. And they go through, uh, they, they illustrate embedded judgments. I think they're a good idea and they're quite easy to do. Once you get a hang of it, they're not very, very difficult, are they? OK, uh, interim judgments. So interim judgments come at the end of the pair of paragraphs. So an interim judgment may look like this. Although there are arguments that the Johnson government has interfered in the economy, an unfaturite approach, their intention is to return to less spending and lower tax after the current crisis. So in a way, you're coming back to your central argument. You may have given this really great rebuttal to your judgment, but you're coming back and you're saying, well, it isn't really the case that they're an, in the long term faturite. So here the student is coming back to the original judgment, but also giving the main reason why they've concluded why they've concluded this. So that's what we call a sustained judgment. So they're given a there is a sustained judgment there. They've explained why uh, they believe in that in you know they've taken the points of the paragraphs on the economy, and they've said here's the main reason why the Johnson government can still be regarded as fatterite on the economy. Uh, by the way, I wouldn't spend more than a sentence or two with a, on an interim judgment. You just don't have the time. I get students who sometimes write like, you know, uh, war and peace as an interim judgment. You don't have the time for that. You know, I think it's sufficient to have, you know, a couple of sentences and, and, and you'll be fine. Uh, thus, it can be argued that although backbenchers have less power than a, when a government has a majority, in recent years, for the reason mentioned earlier, backbenchers have become more assertive, thus the executive is no longer able to dominate the legislature. I think mean, that's a nice uh, interim judgment. So although, uh, another interim judgment, so although referendums give people the ability to contribute to democratic decision making, their harms outweigh their benefits. And so direct democracy should not be utilised in a representative system. Right. These are all forms of uh, interim judgments and they're quite, you know, they're quite compact. They don't go on for a long time. That's probably on the longer side, but they're still it's still quite good. And that's what an interim judgment is. OK, um, I hope you've got I hope that's clear. And again, you can head over to my website and you can see some examples of interim judgments. I should have said, by the way, um, you know, this applies equally to a global or a US essay. I think I did say that at the start, but it's worth making a mental note of that. Let's talk about analysis and what analysis is. Um, now, analysis can be the most confusing concept. So remember, analysis is AO2. This is because it's used in common language to mean many things. When a teacher says more analysis is required, it can mean many things to many students. So there's a helpful breakdown. So here's a helpful breakdown I've created for my students. Firstly, what is an analysis? Uh, examples are not analysis. Examples are AO1. Describing a factual point is not analysis either. Right? Facts are not analytical because generally they happen. Uh, they happen and not, they happen, I should say, and not su subject to your opinion. Right? They're not sort of things that are opinion based. They're factual. Uh, why they happen and their impacts will require analysis. So analysis marks are not awarded for restating your judgment, for example, because that's a judgment mark. That's AO3, right? Um, uh, so separate what an analysis is and what a judgment mark is, what analysis is and what knowledge marks are. So what is analysis? Well, analysis is showing significance. It's showing causes. It's showing consequences, motives, why someone is doing what they're doing, why a prime minister or a president is doing what they're doing, making observations of changes over time. It used to be like this. It is now like this. It used to be that, you know, um, Boris Johnson uh, instituted a, a, a plan of public spending, whereas Margaret Thatcher instituted, whereas David Cameron instituted a plan of austerity, a policy of austerity, right? Showing differences over time. Making comparisons between leaders. I've just did done that with Boris Johnson and David Cameron. Uh, but you could also make comparisons, I don't know, between David, between Boris Johnson and Thatcher, comparisons between leaders and institutions. The House of Lords is not like the House of Commons. And that's a form of analysis or making links to concepts and ideas, links to parliamentary sovereignty. That's a concept uh, links to 
in a political ideas essay, although this is not about political ideas, but in a political ideas, obviously you'll make links to uh, the social contract, right? You'll be These are ideas that you're making links to. Uh, so all of this is analysis and a developed analysis is how you, the more you use of these, uh, these forms of analysis in an essay, the more developed your analysis would be. Yeah. Let me give you some uh, examples of analysis or how to use analysis. So you may want to use these sentences it, when you employ analysis uh, in, in an essay. So this example is significant because that's a good way of showing significance, right? You give an example and you say, this example is significant because the consequence of this policy was that the consequence of the government's policy in uh, at the initial start, at the initial point of, of, of COVID-19 was to be very slow. And that led to a great number of deaths, 190,000 deaths, right? The reason why the Prime Minister did this was the reason why Boris Johnson decided to have a policy of state intervention was if he didn't, it would have caused enormous social upheaval. So the reason why a Prime Minister did that, the motives behind a Prime Minister there. Although this is mostly true, there have been exceptions that are important to highlight, right? So you're showing that, yes, this is, what I've just said is correct, but there are some exceptions that we need to be aware of. For example, you know, you may say that minority governments are extremely weak, right? But then you may say, well, an exception was the example of the hung parliament of the coalition, where actually uh, it was uh, pretty stable, right? It used to be that prime ministers dominated parliament, but today most prime ministers find it more difficult because, right, so you're showing the differences over time. Cameron, unlike Blair, decided that, showing the differences between two prime ministers. Cameron emulating Blair, showing the parallels between prime ministers. The human rights that led to judges having a greater impact upon the political life of the country, right? What, what, le what happened as a result, the outcomes of the human rights act. This illustrates how citizens have been able to use the Human Rights Act in bringing the actions of government to account. Rights and pre that had previously that previously would have been would only have been secured by a few if they could afford to take their case to Strasbourg. You know, these are all really good forms of analysis. Boris Johnson has not returned to austerity because he wishes to retain the red wall seats he won in 2019, and he knows that cutting public spending will not help this strategy. This is because these voters are very dependent on government spending, right? So that's a form of developed analysis there, do you see? So analysis is a really important uh, component to any paragraphs. So here's an example of a paragraph, an analysis in action. I am just going to move myself down for a second. Uh, so here's a form of, of uh, a, a paragraph that illustrates analysis, right? The most significant area of constitutional reform since 97 has been in the era of civil liberties. The Blair government introduced a raft of new measures to give individuals rights and create more fairness for citizens. Blair introduced the HRA in 98 that laid out the rights of citizens into a single piece of legislation. Here we go, that's the facts, that's the AO1. This was significant, a significant piece of legislation because it created a rights-based culture where citizens could use human rights law to protect their rights. Previously, citizens would have to go to the European Court of Human Rights to protect their rights against the state. This tilted the balance away from the state to the individual citizen and brought the UK closer to a liberal culture of rights and individualism. That's a really good uh, uh, um, connection to concepts, right? The Belmarsh verdict, 2005, the Afghan hijackers case, and more recently the verdict against the Department of Work and Pensions against universal credit, so again some facts, some quick facts here, illustrates how citizens have been able to use the HRA in bringing the actions of government to account, rights that previously would only have been secured by a few if they could afford it uh, to take their case to Strasbourg. All of these measures strengthened citizens' rights and brought Britain closer to a modern liberal democracy, typically seen by states with constitutions. So I think that's a good paragraph. I think there's a really good series of an analytical points. I think these are developed analytical points. And I would go out on a limb to say that this is probably a 
uh, it's sorry, this is probably a level five essay. Okay, so I think it's it's very good. Okay, uh, level five paragraph, I should say. Let's move myself back up. Okay, let's just quickly talk about conclusions. Now, conclusions are necessary, but can be shorter than introductions. Uh, in a conclusion, you typically do the following three things. You restate your judgment. You restate your judgment. As I said, that's really important. You give the you give the main reason why you've come to the judgment, and you give a prediction for the future. Right? Restate your judgment. Give the main reasons and give a prediction for the future. What you don't do in a conclusion is you don't repeat your points. So say if in that Thatcherism essay you talked about social and you talked about economic and talked about law and order, you don't go through those points again. I find that sometimes students, they end up just saying the whole thing over again. You don't need to do that. Um, just pick on a single important factor or a big reason why you've come to that judgment. So if, for example, in that essay, the economy was the main reason why you believe that uh, the current Conservative Party has not moved away from Thatcherism, just focus on the economy. Very, That's your big point, right? Focus on that. Don't go through all of your points. Don't summarise your arguments because that's just not necessary. Um I'm going to, yeah, and give a prediction for the future. You can say that moving forward, the current Conservative Party is going to have to uh, uh, be an interventionist party because for the foreseeable future, there are going to be economic crises. And uh, at the time of talking in 2022, I believe that. I think that for the next three or four years, you're going to have uh, economic crisis, right? And so things are going to get quite bad uh, over these next few years. And so governments are going to force be forced to intervene yeah um, so give a prediction for the future um, okay uh, an example conclusion uh, it's a student of mine who had recently uh, submitted an essay to conclude issues such as brexit and devolution have shown a change in public opinion as minority parties become more popular for the Westminster electoral system to remain democratic it needs to change to represent the views of minority parties they focused on minority parties which was one of their issues the decrease in popularity of minority parties recently is not a reliable trend and as constitutional issues such as devolution continue to arise it is important so here's a prediction for the future things are still going to be problematic it is important for minority views to be protected by an electoral system that does not disproportionately represent Labour and Conservatives. The emergence of multiple parties evidently suggests that Westminster electoral system first past the post must change. Judgment is very clear. You've got to get rid of first past the post. But also they've they've given it. I like this as a conclusion. If you could copy the components of this conclusion, I think you would be doing very well because it's not overly long. But it does it does make a separate point in each of the sentences. It's not just repeating things over. And what the student has decided to do is focus on the main reason, which is multiple parties. And that's why first past the post must be replaced. Yeah. OK, so I think that's it. I think I've, I've reached the end. I've reached the end of this. So uh, I put up I've, I put a little graphic together how to write an A star essay. Let me move myself over. Uh, this is on my website. You can download it from my website and print it out if you want to. Uh, but this is how you write an essay. I'm not going to spend too much time on, on this graphic. Um, and um, as I said earlier, um, uh, my website is a really good resource. And do sign up to my Substack because I have I send out regular news items. Uh, most recently, I think I did something on the Human Rights Act. Uh, but I send out regular items and, you know, I, 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 very, I get I get teachers uh, telling me all the time that it's really useful and they use uh, these uh, in class. So I, I would say it's, it's a very valuable resource to have. So do sign up to that and do remember to subscribe to this channel and to uh, and to like this video. And if you've got a comment, just put it at the bottom of the end of the of the uh, YouTube video. Is that what you call it? and I will answer your questions. Um, so thank you very much to the 62 subscribers. Uh, I'm an influencer now to the 62 subscribers. I hope to have very many more uh, in the coming years. But um, that's how you write a 30 mark essay. I hope this has been helpful and I hope you've uh, uh, you've learned or you've you've learned something as uh, you know, you've you've gained uh, some understanding of how to put a 30 mark essay 
together. Do leave a comment and tell me if you found this useful. Uh, I would like to make many more videos. If you've got any ideas as to what I should make a video on, what topics I should cover, do put it in the uh, comment section because I, I am looking out for ideas uh, and I think that will be very helpful. I think we're done. So good luck to you and I hope that's been uh, uh, been useful and uh, hopefully we'll um, uh, you'll come back for a few more essay videos. See ya.